How to Be Orange, Chapter 18, Dutch Housing and Full Frontal Nudity. The quote, The Netherlands is one of the most densely populated countries in the world, my Dutch assimilation course. The next quote, The Netherlands is the 24th most densely populated country in the world, Wikipedia. My first apartment in Amsterdam was brand new. It got worse from there. House number one. When I first moved to the Netherlands, I had the idea that the whole country was a run-down, dystopian Sodom and Gomorrah. But my first ever Dutch place was 90s Nieuwbouw, functional Dutch luxury I had never experienced before. Boom Chicago had arranged the place for a group of us. Spacious bedrooms, spacious kitchen, teeny tiny stairs. The building was on the east side of Amsterdam, by the Entrepot Dock and the Schiepvaart Museum. It's not what I would call a charming neighborhood, but we had a view over the Ostenburgergracht from our living room. It was in that living room that we watched Nelson Mandela being elected president of South Africa on TV. Apparently, the place had been bought by a Dutch couple. They'd wanted to move in when they got married, but something went wrong at the last minute, and they'd needed renters quick. That's where we came in. For us, it was great. The whole place was fully furnished. Everything was brand new. And when we went to open the kitchen cabinets, we noticed that the dinner plates were still in festive wrapping paper saying congratulations to the happy couple. At one point, we had to deliver our rent to the former bride-to-be. She was a tall, blonde doctor, and apparently he was a doctor too. Cautiously, we asked, uh, what had happened? She told us he'd had a fear of commitment and backed out of the whole relationship. And then we got a long and spirited rant introducing us to her theory that as women have become liberated, Dutch men have become cotton ball vatjes. Ah, Dutch relationships. Sometimes they giveth, sometimes they taketh away. A few years later, I was living in a place my roommate had found. We were subletting from a woman who'd moved in with her boyfriend. It was a nice place, fully furnished, and it was all going well until one night there was the woman crying in our living room. We broke up, she explained. He threw me out. We tried to console her. Oh, they're there. And around midnight, still sniffling, she looked up at me and said, well, I guess I'll take my old bed. Where are you going to sleep tonight? House number two. In the second place Boom Chicago arranged, there was an even bigger group of us. This was right behind the Victoria Plain in the Revierenburt district. We'd even heard of Revierenburt as a quiet neighborhood, and this spot was perhaps the quietest. The five of us had the whole house to ourselves. The stairs were even narrower. My room, in fact, was accessed by a ladder. The south-facing balconies looked out onto the lush green courtyard, and as soon as we got there, we flung open the doors and cranked up the eurythmics. It was perhaps 15 seconds before angry banging began. It was not the last time the neighbors would protest at us loud Americans. Our second place was the first time I'd encountered a phenomenon I'd never heard of before, the rent police. One day, there was a knock on the door. My roommate opened it and announced the police wanted to come in. I assumed it was due to the neighbors complaining about the noise, but no, said the rent police. They just wanted to check the details of our rental arrangement. That sounded even worse. They asked how many of us were living in the place, how many of us were allowed to live there, and how much we were each paying. I said, uh, look, I'd feel more comfortable answering these questions if our bosses were present. They were the ones who'd arranged the rental. The rent police then explained the reason they were there, to protect us from our bosses. That's what the rent police are all about. Not kicking people out, but making sure people are not being made to pay too much. Ha! Huh, what a concept. I felt more at home than ever. Our second place was famous. Anne Frank had lived on our street. The Merveda Plain was where the Frank family lived before they went into hiding. As sort of a testament to her memory, there was an old synagogue around the corner, which was, of course, abandoned. At first, we thought of it as a chilling reminder what had happened to the Jewish population of Amsterdam, but after a while, we realized there are still plenty of Jews in the Revierenburg. It's just that, like most religion adherents in Amsterdam, they'd rather be dead than seen in places of worship. 
I believe the former synagogue is now an auction house? Literally, there are moneylenders in the temple. And our second place was the first time I had to live with the shelf. Dutch people are well known for treating sex as a natural part of life. Less well known is that they have the same adult attitude toward going to the toilet. I come from a country where going to the toilet is known as going to the bathroom. The Dutch have no such linguistic confusion. In fact, in our second house, they'd gone to the trouble of separating out the bath and putting the toilet in its own separate room. This was so that we could learn to say, I'm going to the toilet, and so that the process of pooping could be made unavoidably, distractingly pungent. Our toilet chamber was designed to be as tiny as possible. Frequently, my knees would knock the birthday calendar from the door. The exhaust fan was a lovely antique, possibly on the World Heritage List, since it was clearly impossible to update it or renovate it in any way. It was a callback to an earlier time when exhaust fans were scheduled to revolve based on the lunar calendar. Once a month, you might hear the exhaust fan make a small erp. And then, of course, there was the famous Dutch inspection shelf. As I've read, it was designed as a shelf to inspect one's poop. When Freud invented the term anal retentive, it was well possible he was referring to a Dutch patient, whereas the rest of the world finds such a practice scatological and repulsive, the Dutch seem keen to pride themselves on what they've accomplished. Granted, the inspection shelf is not as common these modern days, but the Dutch do still make inspection shelf toilets. Recently, I went on a trip to a home improvement center, and there they were on display. I had to check if maybe these were old models that someone was trying to get rid of, but no, they were new. Clearly, there's still a demand for the Dutch poop pedestal. The reason we needed a replacement toilet was that in our current house, we still have an old inspection shelf toilet. Our house is like many old Dutch houses built on sand. It leans over to one side. Thus, our toilet shelf has become more of a toilet slope, angled backward. Or if you will, it's like a toilet stunt ramp. Every time we flush, it's an adventure. Will our brown heroes make it over the edge into freedom? We still haven't replaced that toilet. Partly because I'll miss the excitement. Americans have been accused of being loud and arrogant, as summed up in the phrase, they think their shit don't stink. This may largely be true, but at least the shit in America is submerged in water. House number three. My third apartment in Amsterdam was a short stay. For a few weeks, I lived right in Amsterdam center on the Nieuwendijk by the single. It was a 17th century building straight from the golden age and it hadn't been properly fixed up since then. Trying to feel at home in that tiny space was like trying to atone for some previous sins, specifically the sins of being too loud the year before. That apartment was the noisiest place I've ever experienced. I had no problem hearing everyone in the building having sex. On Queen's Day, it was so loud outside, the walls were vibrating and not in a good way. I'd woken up from the Queen's night party the night before, and soon I realized I was in the epicenter, ground zero of the noise quake, right in between a stack of speakers blaring house beats and a concert stage that they'd set up for Dutch schlager music. It was not a good match. For anyone who's ever considered being hungover and then remixing the awful saccharine Dutch smartloppen with poorly syncopated house beats, I do not recommend it. Luckily, it was Queen's Day, so I left the house and continued drinking. I moved out the next day. I knew someone who happened to arrive in the Netherlands at the end of April, and her first impression of the Dutch was Queen's Day in Amsterdam. She said, I was like, is every day going to be like this? I guess it's true what they say about Amsterdam. But of course... Not every day is like Queen's Day, now King's Day, in Amsterdam. Even in Amsterdam, it's not the same everywhere you go. If you want the true meaning of the holiday, go to where the kids are. 
In my experience, it's the best selection of flea market items, and it's a wondrous celebration of creativity as the kids try to earn all your loose change. They'll play drums or dance ballet, they'll offer games of skill, and they'll even give quirky high-concept performances. I once encountered a group of girls around the age of 10. They were all asking 50 cents to look inside a tent labeled Peep Show. This seemed all kinds of wrong, but they got my 50 cents. I stuck my head in the tent, and there was a group of girls dressed as baby chickens saying, peep, peep, peep. In the Netherlands, even the kids are politically incorrect. House number four. Next came my experience outside the ring road. If you've ever been on the Ring Road Highway, looked out at the charmless 70s high-rise tower blocks, and wondered who lives there, well, that was me. There were two nice bedrooms, and a third one in bad shape. There was also a home improvement center not far away. I actually took it upon myself to renovate their third bedroom into a guest room. It was a time in my life when I was wondering where I would settle down, in the Netherlands or back in America. And when I found myself voluntarily renovating an apartment we were temporarily subletting, I guess that was the sign. This time, my roommate and I were subletting from a pair of students on one condition. We had to pretend we were guests. They gave us some story about receiving funding to study and to rent the apartment. But instead of studying, they were actually renting out their apartment and taking the study money and the rent money and working in Ibiza. They were not what I would call real students. They were what I would call rich kid cuckers. And they were very clear, whatever happens, do not tell anyone we're in Ibiza. If anyone comes to the door, you tell them you're house guests. And whatever you do, do not let anyone from the city know you're here. So when the city of Amsterdam required me to give a fixed address to the Stadsregister, I gave their address. And they subsequently got in a lot of trouble. But don't worry, I'm sure they're now very successful in Dutch banking. Or perhaps in the building sector. The Dutch Stadsregister is now the focal point of a controversial new initiative called the Participation Contract. The Dutch government would require all immigrants, including Europeans, to sign a document pledging to uphold Dutch values. I say, why not make the Dutch sign it too? If it's good enough for me, it's good enough for Dutch students committing rent fraud. House number five. For a week, I lived on a houseboat in the Amstel, right across from the Icebreaker. I'd always thought of Icebreaker in terms of conversation starter, but since it was November when I moved in and the River Amstel was almost freezing, I soon thought of the Icebreaker in terms of the ship that plows a path through the ice. There were houseboats next to us, which were the more modern structures built on floating concrete foundations, but our houseboat was a real boat docked to the riverbank and displacing water. I'd enter through the wheelhouse and the kitchen. Then I'd climb down the stairs into the ship's hold, which was the main floor. I remember looking out the porthole windows and seeing the water less than a meter under my nose. It seemed surreal to me. For one thing, the whole city was under sea level. To park your home under river level just seemed like tempting fate. It was actually surprisingly spacious and comfortable, but I had to move out after a week. House number six. In 1997, I came across the nastiest apartment in Amsterdam. It was in the east on a street called Frolikstraat, or Cheerful Street. If anyone had ever been cheerful there, it would have been a long time ago. The place was in a row of 19th century working class houses, some of which were being gutted and fixed up. Not ours. The front door opened and the stairs smelled like a wet cave. The crooked staircase led us up to a completely empty apartment, except for the balcony, which was completely full. Full of pigeon shit. Years of pigeon shit. Pigeon shit atop stacks and stacks of pigeon shit. Our jaws dropped. There was a net to keep the pigeons out, but someone had clearly ripped a hole in it. Obviously, that someone was the pierced and unwashed woman showing us the place, who explained, Pigeons need a place to live, too. Taking note of our still-dropped jaws, she casually suggested, You can clean it if you want. 
Somehow, my roommate convinced me to take the place with the rationale, we just won't go on the balcony. And anyway, the floors are beautiful. And he was right. The solid oak planks were lovely. And when we arrived, they were gone. When we moved in, they were just gone. That was my introduction to the Dutch version of unfurnished. They even take the floorboards. There was just particle board laid over the cross beams. Oh, yeah. Didn't we tell you we took the floors with us? No, they didn't tell us, but we figured it out and we got out as soon as possible. House number seven. From the east side, I moved to the northwest in the charming neighborhood called Bos and Lommer. Here, we found ourselves renting from a circus duo named Vincent and Marley. It was a nice big place, but there was a catch. The circus wasn't doing so well, so they had moved into the tiny storage space upstairs to live rent-free, and the deal was we had the place to ourselves unless they needed to use the toilet, or unless they needed to use the kitchen, or unless they needed to rehearse their act in the spacious living room. To be fair, they were on the road a lot, so it was a pretty good deal for us. And when they'd rehearse, it was amazing. He was a huge dude with a Hans Clock hairdo, and she was a tiny Eastern European girl with a lot of makeup. We'd wake up hung over on a Saturday morning, and he'd be throwing her all over the place, kicking the coffee mug right out of my hands. We loved it. House number eight. Vincent and Marley started getting paid more, so they moved back downstairs and kicked us out. That was around the time I fell in love with a Dutch woman who owned her own apartment. I moved in almost immediately. The apartment was also in Bosen Lommer, now called Bolo. It was on the third floor above a tram stop. Our downstairs neighbors, right under us, were from Aruba, from a family that seemed to keep growing. The father was a brown, pudgy man with wild hair and a penchant for loud Latin music. Music with a lot of bass. He wasn't the only one in the family with this condition. One day, their family had grown into the storage space above us with a teenage boy who liked deep house with a lot of bass. We just had our first child, and our bedroom was being bombarded constantly from above and from below. We'd be polite and knock on the door below. The father would always accommodate by turning the music down, not realizing that the bass was still as prominent as ever, and this process repeated itself constantly. On one Saturday afternoon, we'd finally gotten our six-month-old to lie down for a nap when the bass kicked off again from below. Our daughter woke up right away. This time, we thought we'd do something different. We'd all go downstairs to knock on the door. We weren't sure what the neighbor was doing with the music so loud on a Saturday afternoon, but we soon found out when he whipped open the door and said, yes, he was stark naked with a condom in his hand. But apparently, he hadn't expected to see me and my wife. And he certainly didn't expect a six-month-old girl. Okay, I'll turn it down, he said. No, my wife insisted. Leave it. Leave it just like it is and come with me. The naked neighbor trudged upstairs with us, and we ushered him into our bedroom being bombarded by sound waves. It was at that moment that he got it. Months' worth of sympathy and shame flooded into his eyes as he said, No, das will gehorig. Yes, it's pretty loud. He looked at us with a quizzical expression that seemed to say, How did you survive? We looked back at him equally quizzically, saying, We don't know. And then he went to put some clothes on. House number nine. Soon after we solved the noise issue, we were invited to leave our apartment. A developer wanted to renovate the building, and he wanted to pay us to go. So we went. We'd already identified the house of our dreams, and we wanted to buy it. In fact, the owners were selling the entire building. Did we happen to know anyone who might want to buy the building with us? And as it happens, the answer was yes, my father-in-law. He was looking to buy a house around the same time that we were. He liked the place we'd chosen, and he wanted to go in on it with us. Would I be willing to move in with my wife's family? It all seemed so old Europe. On the plus side, I was looking at my father-in-law thinking, live in babysitter. He was looking at me and thinking, compulsive stoop cleaner. We'd ended up having to do some renovations to get the new place ready. 
That would involve us moving into my father-in-law's old house on the Hemonistrat for six months. Meanwhile, he would move into the finished part of the new place to supervise the work. He'd convinced us that the normal contractors were too expensive and that the cheaper Eastern European workers were just as good. I remember a van with the logo Bowen mit Polen, building with the Polish. Next to the logo was a picture of a man tearing down a wall with a sledgehammer. Not the best marketing campaign for building. House number 10. We finally moved into our new home in June 2003. We surveyed the work, which seemed mostly good. True, the shower on the third floor turned out not to have been properly sealed, and we'd later have to pay for years of hidden water damage. True, my father-in-law's bathroom had been tiled with the shiny bit sticking to the wall. And when we moved in, they weren't finished yet. Specifically, there were big nails sticking out of the fence where our kids would play. No problem, said the Russians who were working on that project. The Russians just needed to go out for some supplies. They announced that they needed to drive over to the hardware store, and then they'd be right back. They were not right back. After a few hours, they showed up battered and traumatized. There had been a car accident, apparently. The accident had involved a tram. In his heavy Russian accent, our man explained exactly what had happened. The tram! It came out of nowhere! Despite the rails in the middle of the street, normally a pretty clear indicator of where the tram might be coming from, the Russians had been foiled. The only question on my mind was, at what point had they started drinking? Perhaps they'd started drinking after the accident to calm their nerves, or perhaps they'd been drinking well before that. Either way, the smell of vodka was wafting off of them with every failed attempt to explain. Soon they'd conjured up an image of the tram having willed itself off of its rails in a long contemplated act of liberating spontaneity. Needless to say, no work got done that day. But I couldn't help sympathizing with the Russians. After having dealt with magically gift-wrapped dish sets, disappearing floorboards, and living room circus acts, who's to say that there are no flying trams in Amsterdam?